everyone. Sorry for the time delay. We were experiencing some tricky technical things, but we're up and running. Cool. So welcome to the Genius YouTube channel. My name is Annika. I'm one of the programmers for Genius Robotics. We've got a couple of them, but today I will be the one sitting here and walking you through Intro to Robot C. So what all are we going to do today? Well, we're going to learn a whole bunch of stuff in a small amount of time. So the cool part about this is that this entire video will be available on our YouTube channel after it's broadcast. And I will be available along with the other programmers for Genius to answer questions at any time during this broadcast and at any time afterwards. Just shoot us an email at team or yeah, team at geniusrobotics.com or info at geniusrobotics.com. Or you can send us a tweet, twitter.com slash geniusrobotics or a Facebook message, facebook.com slash Genius Robotics. So I think you understand the point. There's a lot of different ways to get in touch with us, and we really, really love helping out. So if you're ever having difficulty with anything, any programming issue, any uh, technical issue, Samantha issue, you're freaking out because something's not working, it's the night before competition, it's OK. Send us an email. We'll try our best to help you out. So let's start from scratch. This is going to be a pretty quick walkthrough of a couple of different things in Robot C. We're going to learn how to do an autonomous program, and we're going to learn how to do a teleop program. Let's work on autonomous first. So I'm going to share my screen with you, and you'll be able to see what I'm doing, and you'll be able to hear what's going on. There we go. Boop. Okay, and we're screen sharing. So here's Robot C. Everyone's seen the default Robot C environment, or if you haven't installed it yet, this is what it looks like. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and create a new file. Now you're going to notice that in Robot C, there are default autonomous and teleop or user control templates. But we're just going to create a file from scratch because what I'm trying to teach you how to do, what to do today, is how to code. Uh, and if you go ahead and start with a template that has a bunch of pre-created code, it's going to make it more difficult for you to learn uh, how everything actually works in the future. So we're going to start from scratch with a new file. And then I'm going to save this as autonomous uh, test. And I'll just save it to my desktop. There we go. I do suggest coming up with a good framework for how to name your files and where to put them. That way, when you're trying to find that, uh, that program that you worked on two and a half years ago that had that feature that you need now, you won't be struggling looking around on all the tons and tons of files that you'll undoubtedly have on your computer by the end of this season. So here we go. The first thing that, you're wanna do, that you want to do is you want to tell Robot C what your robot looks like. You want to tell Robot C about your robot. So what do I mean by that? Well, obviously, Robot C doesn't care whether your robot is blue or green or whether you've got flames painted on the side. Robot, doesn't, or robot C doesn't care if it's big or small. What it does care about is how many motors and servos and sensors you've got on your robot and how they're configured. So let's go ahead and go up to Robot in the menu here and click Motors and Sensors Setup. We'll be able to go back and do the steps that we're doing right now in this little wizard a little bit later. But for right now, I'm going to show you how this works to make sure that uh, so that you can see so that you can set it up by yourself easily. And then we'll go through how to do it in a more complicated or complex way. So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to add an external controller. So what do I mean by an external controller? Well, if you've ever wired a robot before, an external controller refers to a motor controller or a servo controller. So let's say that we've got on sensor port 1 of the NXT um, a Tetrix motor controller that's daisy chained to another motor controller. And then maybe let's say that on sensor port 2 we've got a Tetrix servo controller. So now what we've done is told Robot C that, okay, so plugged into the NXT, in addition to the power, is a motor controller that's chained to another motor controller. And then in sensor port 2, we've got a servo controller. Make sure that you double check and triple check when you're setting this up what the actual configuration of wiring on your robot is. Because if you tell the program, well, okay, so I've got a motor controller on sensor port 2 and a servo controller on sensor port 1, uh, and then in actuality, your robot is configured a different way, then everything in your program will just go haywire. 
We suggest also making a wiring diagram so that you can visually see as you're coding which, uh, which wires go into which ports. So here we go. So we've got two motor controllers and a servo controller. Now if you click over here on this tab, it'll give you more options as you can see for what motors you can add. Now pay attention really quick because this is super important right here. Motor A, B, and C refer to the ports, the motor ports for the NXT motors on your NXT. So these are, these are A, B, and C. So those are ports A, B, and C. You're not going to use these for your NXT robot unless you need NXT motors. So I don't for this robot, let's just say this hypothetical robot has got four wheel drive and well, no, let's keep it simple. Let's just say we've got two wheel drive and we've got a, um, we've got two wheel drive and we've got an arm that's on a servo. So this first motor is going to be called left and then we're going to call the second motor right. And then these other two don't exist. You'll also want to check and make sure, um, for example, here we go, we've got a left motor that's a Tetrix motor, and then right is also Tetrix. And then these two, since we don't have any, no motor. There we go. And then let's say we've got a servo on an arm. So we're going to call this arm, and it's going to be a standard servo. Just in case you're not familiar already, a standard servo has got, uh, that's the same as a 180 servo that works by telling the servo which position you want it to go to. And then a continuous rotation servo um, works basically the same way a motor does. It's kind of different, but you know, you can figure out more about that later. Okay, so we've got motors and servos and sensors. And this is, this works exactly the same as uh, as motor and servo configuration does, you just tell it, okay, uh, on sensor port three, I'm going to have a touch sensor or whatever. For this robot right now, I'm not going to. We're just going to click okay. So as you can see, robot C went ahead and automatically generated a whole bunch of lines of code. So we're going to go through and talk about what each of these mean. But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to get rid of these lines that say T servo none, because we don't need those. All those are saying is that, okay, for the rest of the ports on the servo controller, we don't have any servos. So we're going to get rid of those lines of code because they're not really useful or important. So this first line of here, or up here is telling you uh, pragma configuration. So it's telling you about the configuration of your robot. So for hubs, you've got center port 1, which has two motor controllers on it. HT motor, HT motor, high technic motor controller. And then here the same thing in center port two, you've got a high technic servo controller. Then these guys here, these are your motors. You got a uh, motor number one, which comes out of the first sensor port, the first controller and port one, that's the left motor. And then you've got sensor one, controller one, port two is the right motor. And then we don't have these other two guys here, so we can get rid, get rid of those two lines of code too. So there we go, we've got the servo arm, so servo S2, C1, 1, servo controller, port 2, controller 1, 1. And we can go ahead and compile and make sure this, this works. And it does, it's good. Cool. All right. Just uh, as a debugging piece of advice really quick, uh, make sure that you never put any more code above the pragma lines in your program. So if I were to right now hit enter, enter, and write, woo, and then try and recompile it, it freaks out. And the reason that is is because uh, you need a hashtag pragma config before uh, the, as the very first line of your code. So even if this was a legitimate line of code, even if I said motor left equals power value, don't worry, we'll learn how to do this later. I'm just giving it a legitimate uh, control or a legitimate piece of code so that you can see that it'll still spit out those errors. Compile program, and it freaks out because you need to have that pragma configuration as the very first line of your code. So here we go. So we've got it set up. So what we've done is we've told robot C, okay, here we go. We've got uh, we've got the robot and it's got two motor controllers, a servo controller, two motors, and a servo. 
what are we going to do with this stuff? Well, we are going to make an autonomous program. And the very first thing we're going to do to make that autonomous program is write a comment about it. So to comment, you can either type slash slash, and then you'll see that it turns green, and you can obviously see, whoop, there's different, that's a comment. Or you can type slash star, and then that comments out everything, uh, every line below it until you type star slash. And there we go. Everything inside here is going to be a comment. But for right now, I just need a single line comment, so I'm going to type slash slash, and then I'm going to write something about what this program does. So I'm going to write, this is an autonomous program created by Annika for the Genius Robot C webinar. The reason that we do this is because you want to make your life easier in the future. There's actually a whole bunch of, bunch of reasons why I suggest commenting in programs, but that's the main one. Make your life easier in the future. Because if, uh, if you come back to edit this code later, if I come back and I'm like, hmm, where's that program that I created for the Robot C webinar? And I'm just looking at it, it's a whole bunch of code. Even if you are the most awesome programmer ever, it's still going to be tricky for you without actually sitting down and looking at each of the lines to figure out what the code is doing. So if you write in English beforehand, okay, here we go, this is an autonomous program, this does this, this, and this, then that'll make it a lot easier on you. It also makes it easier for people, like other people, that come to see your code afterwards because it's even more difficult for them to tell what your code is doing than it is for you because you wrote it. So here we go. We're going to make an autonomous program. We're just going to have this go straight. And the robots, we're, yeah, it's going to go straight. Uh, and that's all we're going to tell it to do for right now. So what we're going to do is down here in task main, we're going to say motor left because that's what we named our left motor equals, and then we're going to give it a power value. We're going to tell it 70. And then under that, we're going to put motor right equals 70 also. Now, for those of you that are coming from uh, NXT programming, um, to you, this might seem like, okay, that's good. We're done, right? This is, this is legit. We've got it going straight. Not quite yet. Next, we need to tell it how long we want it to go straight. So we want it to go, wait one and sec, for one second. So that's 1,000, 1,000 milliseconds. There we go. So what it's going to do right now is it's going to turn the motors on at 70% power, and it's going to go for one second. Here's the part that trips a lot of newbies up. You have to, after you wait for that amount of time, tell the motors to turn off. Because if you just tell them to go and tell them to wait, you're never actually telling them to stop or telling the program to stop. You're just saying, okay, one, two, three, go. And, uh, and, oops, there we go. And you'll end up with a robot that either just goes nuts or the program won't be able to tell what you're trying it to, or trying to get it to do. So there we go. We've got motor left equals 70 and motor right equals 70. And then waiting for a minute, and then, or sorry, one second, and then it turns both of those motors off. So let's compile it and make sure this works. Ding, awesome. All right, remember, syntax is really important here. If I tell this, uh, if I tell Robot C that this motor is called left with a capital L and try to compile it, uh, it's gonna, it's not going to call out as an error, but it's gonna notice it for you. It's gonna say substituting sim similar variable left for left. So it'll automatically for you in its compiling process be able to tell that, oh, okay, you meant uh, lowercase l left instead of uppercase l left. But it's a good idea to make sure that you use the correct syntax every time because that won't always work. Same thing with stuff like missing semicolons. If I take that semicolon out there and try to compile it, nope, that doesn't work because you need a semicolon. Sometimes the robot C compiling errors are very, very useful and they'll say stuff like expected semicolon. Um, other times, it will be very vague, and it'll be more difficult for you to figure out what's going on. So there we go. If we ran this program on a robot right now, as, uh, assuming that robot did have two motors plugged into the first motor controller, what it would do is turn on the motors for 70% power and just go straight for one second and then stop. Cool. What about a turn? So there are a couple of different ways to do a turn. You can have... Here we go. I'm going to turn my video back on for a second so that I can show you this. Whoop, stop. 
Okay. It's working on it. There we go. Okay, so there are a couple of different ways to turn. If you've got two wheels here, you can either turn one wheel off and this one on, which will turn you like that, as you can imagine. Same uh, if you turn this one on and this one off, it'll turn you that way. Or you can turn this one on at a slightly higher speed, which will be more of a gradual turn. It'll go like that. Or you can turn them in opposite directions. And that's called a spot turn because it turns you on the spot. The other two methods of turning, turning one off and the other on, or turning them on at different speeds, work differently um, and not as efficiently, but they might work better depending on the circumstance. So if you are really trying to turn tightly and carefully and quickly, a spot turn will be what you're looking for. If you're trying to make more of a gradual turn, do one of the other things. And it's super easy. So you can probably already figure out how we're going to do this, but just in case, I'm going to run through it really quickly. Here we go. So what we're going to do is uh, set motor left. Let's say that we want to make a right turn, which means that we'll want the left motor to be running. So let's say motor left equals 70, and then to make motor right go backwards, all we're going to put is minus 70, negative 70. There we go, compile. And this would make the robot turn on the spot. Or if I wanted to do a gradual turn, I could just take the motor right out of the uh, out of the consideration, out of the program. Or I could say 70 and then maybe 30% power, and then it would go more gradually too. And all of that compiles and works, and it's great. Cool. What if I want to make a square? Well, how am I going to make a square? This is cool. Uh, <laughs> or, or I think it's cool. Here we go. So what we're going to have the robot do is the first thing you want it to do is go straight. We're going to try something called writing a little bit of pseudocode. Pseudocode basically means English versions, English interpretations of code. And lots and lots of programmers use this, actually almost every programmer, for tons and tons of different languages. So for example, let's, let's go ahead and say uh, that we wanted to make a square. So we're going to call this make a square. Step one in making a square is to go forward. Let's say that we want the square to be, yeah, let, let's say that uh, we're just going to go forward for one second. So we'll do what we're already doing. Um, this square is going to go to the right, I just decided. So we'll want to turn to the right. And then what do we need to do if we're making a square? Well, the next thing we're going to do, of course, is go forward another second. And then after that, we're going to turn right again. You guys seeing a pattern here? Great. You should, because there is one. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and code what we just wrote down. So go forward, turn, go forward, and turn. So we've got uh, go forward is right here. I'm going to copy and paste that and change the motor values to make it easier. I'm also going to add a comment here to tell it what we're doing. So I'm saying, go forward. And then here we turn. By the way, if you have questions, don't forget you can live tweet me, and I will answer them for you. I will see them and answer them. Uh, at Genius Robotics or at Annika Garbers will work for getting me to see your tweets. So here we go. Uh, so if I want to turn and I want to turn to the right, that means that motor right or motor left is going to be 70 and motor right is going to be negative 70. There we go. And then I want to go forward again. All right. So, well, you might think, okay, so here's this. We've got all these lines of code. This compiles. This works. But it's very tedious, right? We're just having to add all of these different kinds, like all of these tons and tons of lines of code to essentially do one thing or two things, go forward and turn and go forward and turn and go forward and turn. Can we consolidate this? The answer is yes. And the way that we're going to do that is with a loop. So if you've used loops in NXT or another programming language before, you understand how they work. It's pretty easy. You're just going to type within task lane while which signifies a loop, and then we're going to call it, uh, we're going to say while true. Uh, while true, let's see, while true, and then we're going to open a curly brace, and then we're going to close the curly brace down here. 
So all that this is saying right now is, well, true is equal to true, which will happen forever. Go forward and then turn. And then go forward and turn, go forward and turn. And as you can kind of tell, that will eventually make a square. It will eventually make a lot of squares, actually. Let's compile and make sure this works. Cool. And then we're good. So you can loop for us uh, for for uh, true. You can loop for a certain amount of time. You can loop for a certain amount of uh, of cycles. So let's say that I wanted this to go forward and turn um, four times to make a square. Um, what I would do is I would declare a variable called elapsed, and then I would say, well, elapsed is less than four. Do this stuff. Or, well, elapsed is less than five, actually, if I wanted it to go four times. So there we go. There's how to make a basic square. Now, you're still thinking, okay, well, this is, this is a lot more lines of code than I expected because this is a very, this is kind of a simple thing, right? How can I make this a little bit easier? Here's what we're going to do. Go up above your task main, and we're going to make something called a drive function. Okay? So what we're going to say is we're going to call this void. Let me double check. We've got this going. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Void drive. There we go. All right. We're going to call this void drive. Woo. I'm going to go ahead and open up another autonomous program that I've got up just to make sure everything's good. I'm running comparisons. Yeah. Okay. Woo. Okay. All right, so we're going to call this drive. Um, well, let's call this let's call this forward. We're going to call this forward. And then we're going to give it two inputs. So we're going to give it in power. We're going to give it in time because that's what we want to happen when we tell it to go forward. We want to be able to give the robot uh, information about. Okay, so here's uh, here's how here's how much you should turn your motors on, and here's for how long. So this is void forward. Yeah. And then we're gonna say that um, your left motor motor left equals power, and motor right equals power as well. And then wait one and sec for time. And then we're going to stop both of these motors. So motor left equals zero, motor right equals zero. Notice that all of this code is outside the task main. So what we're doing right now is we are creating a command for robot C that we'll implement in a second. So what it'll do is basically say, okay, so uh, here we go, forward, and you're gonna put the power and the time, and then it says, whoop, okay, I see forward, what do I do? It turns on motor left and right for the amount of power that you give it, it waits for the amount of time you give it, and then it turns the motors off. So it's basically doing the same thing that all of this entire block is doing. So remember, this is outside of task main, so what we're gonna do down here, let's compile this really quick and make sure Good. Yep. All right. So what we're going to do down here, instead of these one, two, three, four, five lines of code, is we're just going to type forward 70, 1,000, and compile. And we're good. So all it's doing is saying, OK, 70, 1,000. Um, and then we could also create ones called turn. So let's do a left turn. Let's say void left turn. We use camel case here to make it easier for us to see. And then this will also take int power and int time. But the difference will be that because we're turning left, motor left is going to be equal to negative power motor right is going to be equal to power. 
I hope that makes sense to everybody. If any of these, if any of these things are confusing, just send me a tweet, and I will go ahead and answer it, uh, answer questions in more detail. Okay, so here we go. So we've got, yeah, for those uh, wait one sec for time, and then we're turning the motors off. Now, although this right now looks like about the same amount of lines of code as we had before, think about it. If you're trying to make a program that has multiple instances of driving forward or multiple instances of turning, which it probably will, uh, then this consolidates all of this code down here so much more. So instead of these five lines of code here, all we have to put is uh, left turn, and then the power value, and then the time. So 50% power for half a second. And then we'll compile it, and it's all good. Cool. So now we have an infinite loop that is going forward and turning, and we've done it with two functions so that it consolidates the line of code. So the, the actual command part of this code is only two lines. Well, sort of. There we go. One, two. Um, and then if we wanted to, we could also write a stop drive function that would make this easier, too. So let's, let's call this... Um, void stop drive. Um, that does not take any inputs, and all it does is motor left equals zero, motor right equals zero, Woo! and that's it. And so then here, instead of saying motor left equals zero, motor right equals zero, you just type stop drive. thing down here. So what we're doing essentially is eliminating lines of code and making this easier on us. And then by the way, if I want to go and format this and make this code all pretty looking, all I have to do is click on the fancy uh, magic wand up there that Robotsy so happily and hopefully provides. Okay, there we go. So well, true, go forward and turn. Sweet. So we've now just created an autonomous program that does something super basic. Uh, if you're interested in how to do more advanced things with autonomous programming, like uh, how to use sensors or how to, oh my gosh, uh, oh my gosh, you can do tons of stuff with autonomous programs, how to use sensors, how to do stuff like a, a switch cases, all kinds of things like that, send me. Um, Send me an email or a message, and I would be happy to either work with you personally, or if there's enough demand, I would be absolutely happy to do another webinar about at advanced autonomous programming. But for this year, if you're a rookie team and for your first qualifier, you're just trying to do something simple, maybe get off the ramp and like maybe push one of the, um, the tubes across in the field, all you'll need uh, are these kind of commands. If you're going after the control award or you just want to have a smarter robot, I definitely suggest. Ooh, I definitely suggest checking out more uh, more information about autonomous programs, or sending me a note so that I can help you out. So, just as an overview, really quick, this is um, this is our autonomous program from the World Championship, and just so you can see kind of the the difference in depth between what autonomous programs can do. This one has got tons of pragmas because we had a lot of motors and sensors on that robot. We also had this thing called a multiplexer which basically extended the numbers of sensor ports that we had. And we had this guy down here called a protoboard. If you want to learn more about protoboards, they're awesome. Trust me. Send me a message. So uh, we've got a robot C default driver. We'll talk about that for in a second when we talk about Teleop. And then we've also got these drivers for the, uh, the sensors that are plugged into the multiplexer. So we set up the multiplexer, and then we've got all of this stuff going on. Um, these flash the LEDs. This is apply power to the motors. Remember, this looks like the stuff that we just did, these lines here, 68 through 75. So it's the same kind of idea. The stop motors, same thing. The forward function, all the same kind of stuff. Same with the turn. And then we've got, yeah, so we've got straight forward. Um, We've got uh, stuff that works with the motor encoders. We've got code that works with the IR sensor. 
we have a function that just simply initializes all of the motors and servos, which is, by the way, a very good idea um, to put before your both autonomous and teleop programs. Just have a function that initializes your robot and sets everything to zero so that when your robot starts, if it was still reading information from the last program, nothing funky will happen. And then here's our task main. So we pick up values from the proto board, and we've got a whole bunch of if, then, whatever else, all kinds of stuff like that going on. Cool. So if you'd like to learn more about any of the stuff that you've seen in this program or more autonomous stuff in general, send me a message. Again, willing to help. OK, so the next thing we're going to work on is a teleop program, how to make a teleop program. So I'm going to open this guy. This is a this is a very super simple, easy teleop program. Um, and I'm just going to go through this line by line. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to go through this line by line so you can see uh, kind of how it works instead of creating this totally from scratch. So really quickly, this is what the difference between an autonomous and teleop program was, just in case it wasn't super clear or obvious to you guys. So an autonomous program is a program that runs in the 30 seconds at the beginning of the match. This is, well, okay, the control award that's an award that's available this year will apply to both the code that you write in your autonomous and teleop programs, but there is definitely more of, uh, more of an opportunity in the autonomous program available for elements like the control award will uh, require. And then let's see. Oh, and then we go. And then teleop can also be smart. This is something that a lot of people don't realize, and they'll just plug in a um, plug in a value to or plug in the automatic robot C code, even if they don't feel like learning code. Um, they'll just be like, "Boop, generate me a teleop program," and robot C will go, "Okey doke," and spit out a teleop. And then they'll never actually learn how a teleop program works, and they'll never it'll never occur to them that a teleop actually can be smart and receive feedback from sensors. So. All that being said, let's go over a very, very simple basic teleop program and I will show you how it works. Okay, here we go. So this is called Putt Putt Teleop because it's a it's a very, very simple teleop that we created for an outreach robot that we've got running. So we've got four pragmas at the beginning, and if you remember, this works the same way it does in autonomous. Um, if you're working with the same robot, I suggest once you've got the pragmas for one of the one of the yeah, so one of the programs, just go ahead and copy them to the other one. Um, that way you don't have any errors between the pragmas. So we've got uh, two motor controllers, as you can see on this robot. We've got two motor controllers in uh, sensor port one here, and then we've got a touch sensor in sensor port two. We've also got in the motor controllers, uh, we've got a left motor and a right motor. Oh, yeah, yeah, by the way, this is something that I forgot. Um, if you've got a robot that is built symmetrically, you are going to need to reverse one of the motors. So look at your robot and figure out which motor is set backwards from the other one. Otherwise, when you tell them both to go straight, because they're the mirror images of each other on your robot, uh, one's going to go forward, one's going to go backward, and you're just going to spin in a circle. So figure out which motor is reversed on your robot and tell it just in one word, there we go, it is reversed. So as you can see, we've already got uh, a couple of lines of comments explaining what the teleop code does. It's the teleop code for putt putt or outreach robot. It's got two motor drive and a touch sensor on the front. That's what it says. So you're going to want to include the robot C default configuration code. So um, pound include is basically a command that robot C interprets as, OK, see that other code that I wrote over there? Go and get it. If you've, used, if you've used NXT programming before, it's basically the same thing as a my block um, or, or close. It's a close term to a my block. So basically what you're doing is you're taking code from a different program and sticking it in this one. So you're saying pound include joystick driver dot C, which is a bunch of default code that, the, that robot C comes with that helps handle the way that the joysticks interact with the robots. Next thing we're gonna do in this program is define a dead zone for joysticks. The reason, there, there's a reason why you want to define a dead zone, and this is kind of a, a simple error that can be fixed by just, by just adding this like one or two lines of code in. So what a dead zone is, is on the controller, you've got a range of values, right? Here's the dead middle of the controller, so you've got a joystick. And if your thumb is right here in the middle of the, uh, in the, middle of the controller, then that's at zero. 
Pushing it all the way to the front of the controller gets you to 100, and then pushing it all the way to the back gets you to negative 100. Now, the problem with these joysticks is that because they are effectively toys, uh, they have a kind of finicky, sometimes, range of difference and difference in calibration between this, these 200 values that are available for them. So sometimes, if you're not even touching the joysticks, or that if you barely, barely, barely touch them, it will still read a value like 1, 2, 3, 6, even 10 or 15 or 20. So what a dead zone does is it effectively sets up a, a, an area in which if you push the joystick just a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit, or if the calibration is off just a little bit, uh, you won't have a problem with the robot running off and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. It sets up a safe area. Woo. Okay. So a dead zone, we're going to say dead zone is 10. So we define the dead zone for the joysticks as 10. So that's saying within um, within 10 uh, notches of the joystick. So um, that's 10 or negative 10. That's going to be the dead zone. And we're going to apply this in a second. Right now, just that line, just define dead zone. It doesn't actually do anything with it. It just defines it. And I'll show you what it does in a minute. So what we're doing here is converting the joystick values to the power values. So we've got an int called joystick to power that takes uh, that takes uh, the the that takes x, and x will be defined a little bit later on. You'll see that work. So joystick to power takes x, and then what this is saying x is going to be the value from the joystick. By the way, is what it's doing. So it's saying. Uh, okay, well, here's how here's how this is going to go. X is the raw value that comes up the joystick, and then Robots C converts it. So joystick to power, we've got X, and then what we're saying is if the absolute value of X, the absolute value, whether it's negative or positive, is less than the dead zone. So if it's less than 10, return 0. So what that's saying is... Don't do anything if you're in the dead zone. If the joystick is in the dead zone, don't send power to the motors. That's what it's saying. And then otherwise, you don't even have to put, uh, yeah, you don't even have to put else there. Otherwise, return x, so return the value from the motors. Then we've got a function here that initializes slash resets. That's the function that I just showed you before, the motors. This one actually sends power to the motors. So the last one was just saying, okay, here's the dead zone, and here's X. There's what to do with it. This one is taking the values from the joystick, from the joystick to power function that we just made, and sticking them into the motors. So this is called check drive, and it takes two values, the left value and the right value. The left value is going to be um, from the left joystick controller. Yeah, 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 from the left joystick on the controller, and the right value is going to be from the right joystick on the controller. So what we're seeing is motor left, so the left motor, joystick to power, which is that uh, function that we just wrote back up there, left val. So take the take left val, and then joystick to power, and then that's the, there's the X, by the way, is left val, and then motor right equals joystick to power right val. This is something about the touch sensor. I'll go back and explain this in a minute. So then within the task main, what we're going to do is we initialize the robot, and then we say, well, true, because we want our teleop to be infinite. We don't want it to randomly stop. Check drive. So that's this function here. And then this value, the left value, is going to come from Y1 on joystick 1. And this value, right, right here, is going to come from joystick Y2. So still the first joystick, or still the first controller, Y1 and Y2. So the Y axis on the first joystick and the Y axis on the second joystick of the same controller. So I know this was a lot of stuff to take in at the same time, but basically what it's doing, we'll, we'll go backwards for a minute. So check drive is taking the values from the joysticks. This check drive function right here is taking joystick to power for the left value and the right value. And then joystick to power is saying if the absolute value of the uh, of the of of left valve or right valve is 
sorry, if the, if the absolute value of tech drive, I'm getting lost in my own code, oh my goodness, is less than the dead zone, don't do anything, otherwise return X. So that's what this is doing, and then the while true loop, just this executes a bajillion times, the speed of faster than you could possibly imagine. It's checking the drive and checking the drive and checking the drive and checking the drive as you're changing the values on your joystick. So obviously you can imagine that if we said uh, for one second do this, the robot would only work for one second. And then check touch right here. I'll show you how this works really quick because it's very, very simple. Um, what this is doing is we've got a touch sensor on the robot and we're saying that if the touch sensor is pushed, so if sensor mode equals true, make a noise, play tone, and then wait a half a second. So that's all it's saying. And so while it's doing this, the, what this robot will be doing during its Kelly-Op program is checking the drive and then checking the touch sensor. And if somebody's driving the robot, then it'll drive. And if somebody's touching the touch sensor, then it'll make a noise. So again, just to prove that this works, I'll compile it really quick. And look, oh, there we go, it compiled. Again, obviously, there's way more complicated and interesting stuff that you can do with teleop programs. This was just a very, very basic overview of it. This is our teleop program from the World Championships. I'll walk you through it really quickly so you can see how it works. So uh, again, all the pragmas, these are the same pragmas that were in the autonomous program because it's the same robot. And then we've got initialization and setup for the multiplexer. Here's the dead zone for the joysticks. Here's the state for our arms, that same, same kind of initialization stuff. There's the joystick to power function that's converting the joystick values to power values. Same thing for the servos. And then here's where we initialize everything. Here's check drive, so that's basically the same thing as we were doing up there, except that in this program we have a mode built into it where if there's a button pushed, basically all of the motors reverse. Um, so we've got, if you push the button, then the robot will drive backwards instead of forwards. But it's the same concept, right? Joystick to power, right bell, and then we've got a scale. Same thing, same kind of idea for the rack and pinion. If the touch sensor's pushed, turn things off. Same idea for the arm, same idea for the scoop and the flag. So all that it's doing is checking, uh, checking buttons or joysticks and saying if something happens with the buttons or joysticks, this is what you're going to do. So here's task main, and again, you'll see that the entire task main is very, very clean. All it does is initialize the robot, get joystick settings, and then check all of these things. Drive mode, drive, rack and pinion, scoop, blah, 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 blah. And then we've got that commented so that we can see, so that here's the drive that's controlled by both joysticks on controller one. That's a really, really good idea, too, is to put uh, which controller and which things your drive controls, um, just, so, just so it's easier for you to understand when you're scrolling through your code. See, we've got all of these comments here, read values from the manipulator, read values for the right opinion, all of that kind of stuff. So uh, several times I have mentioned a wiring diagram. Well, what do I mean by a wiring diagram? I'm going to show you an example of one. Give me one second to pull it up. By the way, any questions to me can still go to uh, um, AM. Sorry, what am I talking about? Annika, uh, Annika Garvers on Twitter or Genius Robotics on Twitter. So here we go, here's just, this one isn't ours, but this is an example of a wiring diagram from another FTC team. I'll go ahead and share my screen again. Whoop. So this is a wiring diagram. So here's the NXT. Basically, it's just a visual representation of how all the wiring on your robot works. So here's their NXT. They've got ports here. These are the wiring, uh, these are the motor controllers that are connected to each other and then also to motors. They've got the Samantha, the battery, the on off switch, the motors. And all of this is actually very well and like uh, fancily drawn. Our team, a lot of the time, if we're just trying to get stuff done, we'll draw basic shapes and then captions for them. So we'll say motor controller one, two, and three, and it'll all be squares. That's okay to do. 
um, just remember if you're trying to make something that's very easily understood by somebody else that it's a better idea to take some more time on it and do something like this that's easier for people who might not live in your brain to understand. So, whew, that was just a whole bunch of stuff at the same time. I realized there was a lot of information to take in. The recap really quick of what we just learned. An autonomous program is uh, not driver controlled. There we go. And a driver controlled program or teleop program is. Uh, the autonomous program needs pragmas. And then in the task main field, you need to give it the controller, uh, yeah, the, the directions for what it's supposed to do. So tell the motors and the sensors and the servos what to do. You can make your life easier by setting up drive, stop, uh, turn functions at the beginning of the program. And you can also make your life easier uh, by making the code as clean and as commented as possible so that when you go back to look at it, uh, you'll be able to see all of uh, see all of what everything is doing without having to actually like go in and be like, okay, here's this line, this line does this, and this line does this. English, it's easier. And then a teleop program, same kind of deal. You're going to need pragmas. You're going to need a setup for uh, the joystick to power, and you're going to need a setup for how you're actually assigning the joystick values to the motors and converting them to power. So that was how to make an autonomous program and how to make a teleop program. If you would like the sample code that I used from today, send me a message, info at geniusrobotics.com or Annika Garbers on Twitter or Genius Robotics on Twitter. Whew. Uh, and uh, and I'd, I'd be happy to share that with you. If you like me, if you would like some help with your current code, I can do that too. Um, we can set up a Skype. We can set up a meeting. Whatever you want to do, I'm here to help. So really quick before we end this, we've got autonomous program and teleop program under our belts. Some people that already know how to do both of these things are going to be asking, well, okay, so I can do that. I can write an autonomous, I can write a teleop. Tell me how to make them better. And these are my tips. Number one, same as with the robot design, keep it as simple as you possibly, possibly can. Simple is way better and way, way easier. So if you've got a whole bunch of code, that is doing a very simple task, chances are you're doing it wrong. Go and look in and, and figure out how you can condense that code or reassign values or create functions to make it easier and simpler on you. Second thing, I know I've mentioned this 6,000 times, so I'm gonna mention it very briefly now, but comment the heck out of your code. Comment your code. It helps you, it helps other people, it helps judges. There's another thing, it helps judges. If you bring your code into judging and it's not commented, that's not going to mean anything to them. Tip number three is if you have written code before and your Robot-C development environment is new to you, uh, or if you're just not very comfortable in Robot-C, or if you're just looking for a faster and easier way to write your code, I recommend checking out a different compiler, well, not a different compiler, a different content editor, um, such as the VI or Vim content editors, and those will be a whole lot faster and easier for you to use once you get good at them. And then you just copy your code from those content editors back into the Robot C environment, and then you can run it, and it'll be great. Um, so yeah, so use VI or Vim. Uh, version control of your programs. If you're not familiar already with what GitHub is, Go check it out, GitHub, G-I-T-H-U-B. It's awesome. Git is a great, great, great way for you to control uh, the versions of your code. And so if you make a revision and you don't want to create a whole new program for it, but are you, you still think that you might need to get to this one here, so here's your change, here's this one, uh, and you don't want to make a brand new program, version control, version control, version control. Also, it looks super impressive to judges, and also once you get practice using this, you're more likely to use it in the future. If you go into software engineering and don't know what version control is, uh, good luck. That sounded terrible. I'm really sorry. Use version control, it's a good idea. And then also document your code in your engineering notebook. I've seen a whole lot of engineering notebooks that have great, great, great diagrams and detail and information about the robot design process, but nothing about the code. And I understand how this can be easily, like that's an easy trap to fall into because you have to make diagrams for constructing your robot. You just have to, like in order to visualize your idea. Visualize your idea for code two. Write the steps down, do lots and lots of pseudocode, and then keep track of your versions of code so that you can add important changes into your engineering book. 
So there we go. We got autonomous program, we got teleop program, we've got commenter code, make simple, simple, easy to understand code, and uh, and use GitHub and Vim and other tools that are available to you. Also, just from personal experience, this is uh, the best tip that I can give directly to those who will be actually programming the robots this season. Don't freak out. Don't freak out, don't freak out, don't freak out. Compiler errors that are confusing to understand are gonna stress you out. That's just how code works. Uh, well, for most people at least. Um, if you're working on code and you don't understand something or there's a bug, last year I spent eight hours working on a bug that was a very, very simple like 10 second fix. And the problem is, the sad part is this stuff just kind of happens. If you find yourself in a loop of frustration and like, ah, why isn't the code working? Do yourself a favor and stop. Just take 30 seconds, have a deep breath, go watch a YouTube video, go get a snack, and come back to it. Because actually, cognitively, this is not just like Annika spitting stuff at you, this is science. If you keep working on the same problem over and over and over and over and over again, your ability to actually solve that problem decreases because those parts of your brain that are being used for solving a problem like that are getting tired. Science. So anyway, that was all I've got today. We learned about autonomous programs. We learned about teleop programs. We learned some tips for how to do code. I will be probably doing a more advanced autonomous uh, session a little bit later on and a more advanced teleop session. If you have specific things you'd like to learn in those sessions, please let me know. And again, this video will be available on YouTube as soon as this broadcast ends and for as long as we choose to keep it up. So I'm Annika from Genius Robotics, FTC Team 5875. Good luck with your season, and uh, we hope to see you around. If you need help with anything, let us know. Don't feel free to reach out. Thank you for watching.